Hey, welcome to today's review of the brand new MSI Katana and some reasons why you probably should not get one yet. What? No, no, I don't think that MSI is ever going to send me any review units. No, no not ever. No, no, that's off the table. Yes, this baby monitor is here on purpose to show you the sacrifices I am making to give you this review. Okay, so this specific Katana 15B12V comes with an Intel i7 12750H and a brand new RTX 4050 with 6GB of VRAM and in this configuration up to 105 watt total power for the GPU, which in reality almost never reaches more than 85 watt. Two years ago, MSI was also one of the first manufacturers to release laptops with the RTX 3050, so they really are fast when it comes to new GPU releases. You'll have to give them that. P.S. There is also a 17-inch version, which is having a stronger CPU, um, like the i7 13620H and the RTX 4060 with 8GB of VRAM. Both laptops are very similar in design and look, build quality and even performance, whereas the stronger 17-inch model is a bit faster, of course. But we are going to focus on the smaller 15-inch version in this review. So make sure to subscribe to the channel in case I'll manage to also test the 17-inch version in an extended gaming test. Okay, now back to the review. The build quality of the laptop is alright. It has a total height of 2.5 cm when closed and it weighs 2.25 kg, also known as 4.96 pounds. It has a pretty obvious gamerish design, especially considering the look of the RGB lit keys. The 17-inch version weighs a bit more with 2.6 kg, by the way. Well, as of the release of this video, the MSI Katana 15 in this configuration costs about $1,300 or 1750 in Euro. This price should drop quite fast as it is way too high. Though other countries might come with slightly different hardware like 32GB of RAM instead of 16GB and a different i7. The 17-inch 4060 version would cost ridiculously high 2100 euro, which is just nonsense. The 144Hz Full HD display offers adaptive sync and has a maximum brightness of only 255 nits, which is not bright enough to use it outside or next to a window on a bright day. The measured color accuracy is relatively low with 67% sRGB, 48% NTSC and a 50% coverage of the Adobe RGB color space. You won't notice this as a regular user and of course you still can use creative apps like Photoshop or Premiere if you're not a professional that is bound to color accuracy for customers or anything. P.S. You can easily open the lid with one hand which is really nice. The keyboard has a four zone RGB functionality. It comes with a small numpad and highlighted WASD keys and arrow keys as well which gives it a visible gamerish look. Writing felt firm and comfortable. The touchpad is very mediocre, but it has a good clicking sound. The laptop offers a total of three USB-A ports, of which two are USB 3, as well as a USB-C port with Thunderbolt and DisplayPort compatibility. Furthermore, it offers an HDMI 2.1 port and a LAN port, so the connectivity is what you would expect. But most of the connections are on the right side of the laptop, which is suboptimal if you have little space to use your mouse and I don't actually understand why manufacturers are still doing that. The sound of the speakers is clear and the quality seems to be okay. The overall loudness is acceptable as well. There could be a bit more bass though, which is of course a common issue with most laptop speakers. Overall the sound is not terrible compared to the average gaming laptop, but it's not great either. It seems to work better for classical and pop music rather than for heavy guitar sounds. By the way, this is what the integrated camera looks like and what the integrated microphone sounds like. Now let's talk about the fan control, fan noise and the temperatures. The MSI Control Center allows you to choose between five different presets for fan speed and performance. You can also manually set the fan speeds when you are using the extreme performance mode and when the fans are at maximum speed using the performance mode and the laptop is on a laptop stand, running Cinebench resulted in a maximum temperature of around 75 degrees with some light power throttling after around 90 seconds, resulting in a boost clock of 3.7 GHz on the P cores and 2.9 GHz on the E cores. In that scenario, the CPU is able to draw a constant 85 watt, which is quite a lot. 
At full speed the fans are quite loud, but I did have much louder laptops before. If you are using the balanced mode the laptop is actually pretty quiet considering the performance it has. On idle the laptop can turn completely silent, so if it had a decent battery runtime it would be great for libraries and such, but it doesn't. We'll talk about that in a bit. Overall the cooling system seems to be really good. Well done MSI. Thanks to that the temperatures are quite low when gaming as you can see here, 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 I think over here. The laptop surface actually stayed pretty cool while gaming. It never actually felt really hot on the WSD keys while testing it. The Intel i7-12650 isn't the newest CPU MSI could have used for this laptop, but it is a very fast processor nonetheless and should be absolutely sufficient for years to come. It is sporting 6 P cores and 4 E cores. The P cores support hyperthreading, allowing for a total of 16 threads. In Cinebench R23, using the performance mode, it reached a pretty high maximum of up to 15,891 points in the multi-core test and 1,772 points in the single-core test. Using the balanced mode, the multi-core score was still around 15,000 points in the first run. These results will drop a bit after a few runs due to the power limit throttling or temperature throttling, depending on the fan speed. In PC Mark 10, it got a score of a very impressive 7,382 points and still 5,286 points on battery. The 17-inch version was achieving 7,736 points. All of that is quite fast. The built-in 1TB Micron PCIe Gen 4 SSD was reaching sequential reading speeds of around 3,900 megabytes per second and writing speeds of around 3,100 megabytes per second in AS SSD benchmark. The laptop offers a second M.2 PCI Gen 4 slot. PS, the RAM is also upgradable or exchangeable easily. The 53 watt hour battery is quite disappointing. The laptop doesn't seem to manage to reduce the power consumption to a minimum, so even on idle with 20% display brightness and activated Wi-Fi, I only saw a runtime of 5 and a half hours. Watching YouTube with 50% brightness, using headphones it only achieved 3 and a half hours. And gaming on battery ended after 45 minutes, whereas demanding 3D titles are more or less unplayable due to the power throttling that occurs when the laptop is unplugged. It's clearly not designed to game on battery. When plugged in, the laptop would pull around 150 to 170 watt from the wall, which is no problem for the included 240 watt PSU it comes with. But the PSU might differ in other countries though. I actually made a dedicated video on the gaming performance of this specific laptop. And if you are interested in that, I will link to it over here and in the description as well as within the end card of this video, so you can check it out afterwards. The dedicated RTX 4050 is a brand new entry-level GPU by Nvidia and it is the first 50 series mobile card to offer 6GB of VRAM, which is finally acceptable for Full HD gaming, at least for a while. The laptop offers a MUX switch, which didn't seem to have a big effect on the gaming performance anyway. It was activated due all my testing though. Overall, it is safe to say that you can play any existing video game as of the making of this video with at least 60 FPS on this laptop. And thanks to Nvidia's frame generation technology, newer titles that support DLSS 3.0 can provide a noticeable extra boost if this tool is activated. I really love the feature and I didn't seem to have any visual problems except for some in-game menus that sometimes produce weird artifacts if frame generation is on. But I had the impression that this laptop suffered from bad frame times. That means that despite high FPS in a few games, I was often seeing some stuttering and frame drops. I'm not sure if that's an issue of the laptop or if the Nvidia drivers haven't been optimized for the new Ada Lovelace architecture by Nvidia. Also, the maximum 105 watt of the, of the GPU were never reached. The average maximum was around 85 watt and it barely ever reached 92 watt. Either this is by design or MSI has to fix this via a BIOS update. PS, the 17 inch RTX 4060 version didn't have the same frame time issues. And now we're going to have a quick look at the performance in some games. The brand new Atomic Heart actually ran really well on ultra settings, looking really great with or even without activated frame generation. Without frame generation I saw an average of 110 and a 1% low of around 42 
And with activated frame generation, I saw an average of 172 FPS and a 1% low of 52. The stutters were very seldom and I personally would still call it a decent gaming experience. In Elden Ring I was using the maximum settings and saw an average of 60 FPS, which is coincidentally the FPS cap this game has if you are not trying to get around that using mods. The 1% low was relatively high with 41 FPS, so I guess you won't be able to blame the laptop if you're going to die and die and die and die again and uh, I guess you know. Okay, so next. Hogwarts Legacy was another game in which the frame times weren't as good as I would have liked them to be. On medium settings with activated frame generation I saw a very high average of 117 FPS on average, but a very low 1% low of only 30 FPS. And as you can see it is of course playable, but you will experience some stutter once in a while. Which in this case could also be the game's fault as well, because it has issues on so many systems right now. Maybe they'll fix that in a patch or so. Using the high preset with frame generation and DLSS in quality mode, Microsoft's Flight Simulator worked perfectly fine with an average FPS of 92 FPS and a 1% low of 43 FPS. Frame generation is a real game changer as his title struggles to produce high FPS on pre-RTX 4000 series cards. By the way, in all the time I was benchmarking these games on the MSI Katana using the RTX 4050, I never saw or saw a broken frame or artifacts when using frame generation. I have to admit that I'm a big fan of this tech and I, I really, really like it. In Blender I was comparing the NVIDIA RTX 4050 mobile of this laptop with the RTX 4060 in the Katana 17 and the RTX 2060 of my personal Asus TUF A15. And as you can see here in all the tests the 4050 and the 4060 are relatively close together with a noticeable distance to the RTX 2060. Using Blender with the RTX 4050 is absolutely possible, but you will have some issues when you're trying to render a very big composing as the VRAM will be too small. But in that case you could always use the CPU to render which would take longer but will use the bigger regular RAM of the laptop. Well overall I would say that for a price of around 1700 euros or 1300 dollars the Katana is way too expensive. It's not a bad laptop but the rather dark and color inaccurate monitor, the bad battery run times and the light stuttering issues aren't screaming premium. If you can get it for something around $1000 or less I'd have a better time recommending it. So make sure to check the current price before making up your mind. The performance of the laptop is great though. The fast CPU, GPU and SSD make it super fast and responsive, even for heavier tasks. Also the good keyboard and overall build quality are pluses. If you can get a similar RTX 3060 for much less money, I would probably choose that instead. It is clearly not designed as a super mobile laptop for school or battery use. The main target group definitely are gamers. That's all for today. If you enjoyed the content, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more reviews, GPU tests and other stuff. Thanks for watching, see you next time, bye bye and cheers.